last minute setup here. Right. Yeah, I wasn't totally prepared. <laughs> Well, everybody, this is it, I hope. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. It's an old guy in the modern age. Um, I can see everybody's chiming in, and, uh, you know, we've got several hundred people uh, online at this point, and I'm just real, real excited to be able to share this with you. You know, Gene and I were just talking this morning. It's been five years uh, almost since we published the first book and how much things have, how I've grown, the protocol's grown, um, you know, the success of the protocol. And uh, so the purpose of this is not to go through every little detail, but is to take the, the foundation of the protocol and and try to simplify it for you and then we're going to be answering questions as we go through this. We've got a lot of questions uh, that were pre-submitted. We, I can even see we've got some coming in online now. And so Jean's, Jean's right here next to me. Hi, Jean. Hi, everybody. And, um, uh, and so basically that's it. So we'll get started here. And, you know, basically, thank you for the questions. Um, we built a lot of them in here. We're going to address some of them in particular individually. And, uh, and just thank you for taking the time to do that. All right. After great agony and a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of marital stress, <laughs> mainly due to me, the book is coming Yay! out. Okay. <laughs> the book is coming out. And so, uh, we had hoped to be selling it today, starting today, but the the people who are printing, I'm not going to use any names, changed how they did everything. So we have a different printer. And so within a few weeks, these will be able to be printed, uh, but you can uh, get a pre-order copy if you want at nimichekprotocol.com. That's our regular kind of little bookstore. Um, we got, it's twice as big as before. I put here over 50 charts. I counted and I was up over 70 and I thought I had to make a mistake. So I just put 50. We got all sorts of charts and flow things to help you through this. A lot of details because there's a lot of questions about when do you go from inulin to rifaximin or rifaximin off rifaximin and vagal nerve stimulation. The, the typical common aggression anxiety things, plateau as I put here. Uh, some of my thoughts about pans and pandas. So, um, we got this to take us through the next several years as we uh, continue to learn more. All right. Now, and this is just a kind of, you'll see a lot of little charts like this. Um, uh, we've got here continuous, you know, like this is after you get improvement, there's different things that can happen. So you would find where your child is falling into, or here you've got, you know, anxious, angry behavior. Is there an obvious trigger? Or is it associated with like thirst and hyperactivity? And so I'm able to help you break through and, and this is actually how a doctor thinks and to get you to go through these algorithms so that you can make the best decision uh, for your child through this whole process. People have all these really complicated thoughts uh, about what's going on. And like there are plenty of, providers you go and they do all this testing you got all these abnormalities and they kind of think that you gotta patch all of these things up and your child's going to be healthy for some reason and medicine actually doesn't work that way the trick in medicine is and i learned this in my days in helping develop uh, treatment strategies in hiv if you find a whole bunch of things that are abnormal the trick is you have to struggle and find typically the one thing that's responsible for all of that and in, in its simplest simplest form this simple little protocol what it does is it lowers inflammation and that allows the body to recover the simplicity of the protocol 
or I should say the power of the protocol is not in the ingredients. The power of the protocol is in the child's ability to naturally repair their own nervous system. The things we have learned uh, today are very different than just 10 years ago. And so when you reduce inflammation from a cellular standpoint, and now this is just in the brain, the microglia, those are the cells that prune and repair your brain. They start working better. We now know you have increased stem cell production and function in the brain, okay? Neurotropins, these are chemicals. They're like floating wrenches that can go and repair things. They start working better. Neuron replication. They've discovered in the last two years that if you reduce inflammation, say in an adult, there's this part of the brain called the hippocampus. That's your memory, your cognition, uh, your emotions that adults are replacing 90% of their neurons with brand new ones every three weeks. But you got to lower the inflammation. We have these very, very powerful things happening in the kids and uh, in, in the adults who are doing the protocol as well. And then what do we see? Autistic features get better. Developmental issues start, you know, the brain starts catching up by pruning again. Our cumulative brain injuries that build one on top of each other, they start finally to become repaired motor sensory issues um you know these are not always associated with autism they start getting better emotional problems start recovering and uh, the focus and attention problems you know known as add or adhd they recover as well but again fundamentally it's just basically we lower inflammation the child fix the brain okay that is a huge amount of science supporting that position and that's where you need to stay focused. Okay. Simplicity, people call it simple. I like to think of it as finesse, that we just, we zeroed this down to a very simple thing. So we've got basically fish oil, olive oil. You just, you know, here's your kid. My, you know, kid's about five. Here's your dose. Give it to him every day. Now, the new book has a real emphasis on don't overthink the fish oil and olive oil, okay? Um, we, when we wrote the first dough, the first book, you know, I put in there, oh, if things aren't better, try double in the fish oil. We just didn't know. Well, five years later, we know. You've got to have the fish oil and olive oil in place, but they aren't critical for success. That's really the second piece here, balancing the intestinal bacteria. And we're going to discuss using uh, inulin or rifaximin, and if you have failure, meaning it's not working or, th or it is working and then it stops and you hit the plateau, that's where you look. You don't fiddle with the fish oil or olive oil doses. You look at the gut bacteria. We're going to go into that. And then after that starts, we're going to talk about when does the vagus nerve stimulator come in? When do you need that? And what do you look for in that? I'm going to touch on real briefly, uh, there's a couple questions people had is, what did the fish oil and olive oil do? And in a very primitive level, uh, primitive humans would eat plants, and plants contain omega-6 fatty acids. And these, and, and it's in the plant, it's called linoleic acid. And that is... Uh, a molecule and it turns into about a half a dozen other molecules that turn on natural healthy inflammation. So if you get an infection or you sprain your ankle, you need a little inflammation to turn that on. Now, you just don't want it to go nonstop, you know, chronically. And then omega-3s that we get uh, primarily from seafood and, and wild animals, um, they turn into the molecules that turn off inflammation. Okay, so we need a little sixes to turn it on. We need some threes to turn it off. And that's where you have this kind of normal, healthy balance. And I always point out to people, they say, did primitive humans get many omega-3s? There was no plumbing. They always had to live by fresh water. So they were always eating fish, snails, clams, you know, whatever you can, the shrimp, whatever you could get out of the water. So they actually had a very, very high intake of that. Now, what's happened in the last century is the development of vegetable oils have a lot of omega-6s in them. And the way, you know, the, the meat we get from animals 
we've gone from an eating animals that were wild, like, you know, grass fed beef, which is kind of similar to a wild cow, okay, eating just grass. They have as much omega-3 in them as halibut, all right? But you put them into a feedlot where you feed them soybeans and corn. I mean, you are essentially feeding them soy oil and corn oil. You lose the omega-3s and you get too many omega-6s. So what's happened in, in our diet is the omega-6 intakes have gone up. The omega-3 intakes have gone down in the last century. And now we're in this modern inflammatory process here where some people say it's about in America about 20 times the amount of omega-6s. Uh, I saw one recent thing they say maybe upwards to 50 times the amount of omega-6s in people. So this is a problem that's triggering a great great deal of inflammation in not just your child but every single person in your family. Okay now so what we're doing is basically we add more threes that's your fish oil okay and we try to get rid of these vegetable oils where we can. And fortunately, olive oil has an omega-9 in there called oleic acid, and it will block the toxicity of the sixes. So that will help rebalance our omega-6, omega-3 process. And it's very, very dramatic at lowering inflammation. All right, what do you say, Gene? We uh, hit a couple of questions here. Sure. Um... What do we got first? Who... Uh, let's do Vendana's. All right. Vendana, thanks for the questions. Um, my son is five. Uh, he was improving when we started the protocol, but now he's relapsed and not improved. He's nonverbal. Vendana, he's at the plateau. And so stay tuned. We're going to cover that in great detail. Here is one from my friend, uh, Putri Zarina in Malaysia. Hi, Putri. And uh, she's asking about, you know, bowel movements and constipation and things like that. And uh, there's some thoughts out there that if you need to have a bowel movement every day, otherwise stools like festering and poisonous or something like that in you. And that's really not true. Um, if uh, generally doctors, if somebody can have a bowel movement every several days and they're comfortable, it's normal consistency, there's no cramping, they, it doesn't seem to bother them, we don't worry about it. Doctors do not try to have somebody have a bowel movement every day, okay? You, you, your main concern is, are they comfortable? Do they have any other symptoms with it? You know, certainly if there's blood or mucus or something, that's of concern. But if you're going every several days, even once a week, I've had several patients with that. They have a bowel movement just once a week, no problem, and I just leave it alone. I don't worry about it. Okay. Now we're going to move on here a little more. So, as I said earlier, you know, to, in, the, in the new book, we'll say basically, your kids say seven, here's your dose of fish oil, olive oil. Try to use these uh, approved brands if they're available. Give them every day. Now, forget about them. Focus on the gut. Because controlling SIBO, or small intestine bacterial overgrowth, is absolutely critical to your kid's recovery. And the reason, well, so the two reasons here is that when you get SIBO, the bacteria, and it's a little small here, uh, we're learning can make propionic acid. And these studies go back about 10 or 15 years where they were first were seeing this. Propionic acid can have an impact on your child that's similar to uh, Valium and LSD combined. It just, this is in the kind of that stereotypical case. It's not necessarily common where something triggers SIBO and the parents will notice just within a week, suddenly their child's not responding to them. It's because they have now bacteria, normal bacteria from the colon, the fish, as I put it, and they are bad bacteria. These are normal bacteria just in the wrong place. They're living up in that small intestine, all right? And now not all bacteria make propionic acid, but if it does, your, your, the cognition in your child now is greatly, greatly subdued, okay? And then, you know, the upper intestinal tract is not built for small, uh, for bacteria. And when you get this excessive bacteria up there, it overwhelms it and you get leaky gut. 
okay? There's, you could probably talk about what leaky gut is technically for a whole day, but basically it's just bacterial stress and the intestinal tract can't handle it and you leak out. Now, one little important point here. Everybody has in their intestinal tract viruses, uh, Archaebacterium, phage, protozoa, and yeast or canada. Everybody, all right? I have never seen a paper that suggests that yeast or canada can cause leaky gut. Never. Now, they talk about bacteria, their yeast shifting around, or they may do uh, sampling of, you know, you get a stool sampling your child down here from the rectum, and they're talking about yeast and looking at that, but that doesn't matter. The business end is up here in the small intestine. That's where we focus, all right? There's one example where yeast can protrude through the tissue, all right, in medicine. You typically have a somewhat destroyed immune system. I'm talking advanced AIDS. You're being treated for like leukemia, and often those patients die in two weeks. So the traditional medicine, <laughs> that's what yeast penetrating your tissue does. It kills you, okay? So we got to just stay focused on the bacteria. Now, that's I'll get off my soapbox on that. Now, when you get leaky gut, where's it leak? On that tissue right outside the small intestine. So this is your small intestine. When you leak out, the tissue right there contains about 80% of all your white blood cells in your entire body. So 80% of all the cells that can release inflammatory chemicals are literally one cell away from the inside of the small intestine. And that's why when you even have small amounts of bacterial overgrowth, that inflammatory stress, it's hard to overstate how significant that is. Those chemicals will leak out. Many adults will complain they hurt. It makes their joints ache. It can cause all sorts of rashes. And those chemicals can flow right into your brain. And all of those things I said earlier on, the stem cells, the neurotropins, uh, the repair mechanisms, they basically quit working. And so we got to focus on 80% of the immune system being activated here. We, that's where this is just so, so critically important. And with that inflammation, as we, you know, we talked about before, that's why we get developmental delay and human brain injury. Okay. All right. So we're trying to break it down in the new book to be just really simple, okay? Now, here we're gonna use an example where we start on inulin. And you'll find in the book, when do you start inulin versus when do you start rifaximin? Basically, inulin works really well in the younger patients. And by 20, I don't think I've ever seen inulin help somebody neurologically recover. It may help your digestive stuff. It can help anxiety a little bit. But if somebody has, an adult has an injury from, say, a concussion, okay, the inulin, I've never seen that work. And this, this, you know, transition from being more effective in the young to the old, I think just is a reflection that we see a normal transition of bacteria in children. The, the proportions of different bacteria naturally change through that time. And I think we're just picking up something like that. So if you have a Younger child, say generally under 13, 14, uh, I always start with inulin. And if you don't see improvement, so you already got them on fish oil and olive oil, okay? If you don't see improvement in three or four months, then it didn't work. You ought to see something, okay? You don't need, most people see it in weeks, but it's certainly at three or four months because there can always be some little thing gets in the way, a little cold or something that confuse it. Um, then my general approach is I go to monthly or what I call cyclic rifaximin, where we use a antibiotic called rifaximin to control the bacteria here. And uh, the book goes into the doses and things. It's twice a day for 10 days every month. We do it on schedule. Boom, boom, boom. And we just force the bacteria to stay like this. Now, again, if in three or four months you don't see anything, what we now know is happening is so you would give you have the bacterial overgrowth. So you have the fish living with the birds. You give them rifaximin for 10 days. 
what can happen in some kids is within a week, they relapse again. Okay. And at this point, because there are a few of them, they have intense symptoms and we can see it like really say violence or super bad aggression when they have overlaps. So we've seen this very rapid process happening. If that happens, we put the, uh, the children on continuous rifaximin, meaning twice a day, every day in a nonstop fashion. Now rifaximin, I want to point out, uh, technically it's an antibiotic and that causes pause in a lot of people as, as it should. But it's a very different, the single most unusual bacteria or antibiotic in all of medicine. It has a couple features that makes it very, very safe. One, it doesn't get in the bloodstream. If a medicine can't get in your bloodstream, it can't say, go to the kidney and irritate the kidney. If it can't get there, it can't get to your brain to give you a side effect. It can't get to your skin to give you a rash, okay? Two, it's the only antibiotic that does not damage your, your biome. You do not permanently lose species when you use rifaximin. We've had this medicine for 30 years. We've used it nonstop in adults. We know a lot about it. It will not damage the, uh, and, and cause you to lose species, which is, there's no other antibiotic that can do that. Okay, so it, it won't cause any more damage. And the other very important thing, if we need it continuously, uh, there is no long-term resistance to this. And that means most antibiotics, if you use them all the time, the bacteria learn and will mutate. So now the, the antibiotic won't affect the, the bacteria. This is impossible with rifaximin. And, and, you know, we've had it 30 years. We would have known this, if this is the case. So it's very, very safe. Doesn't get in the bloodstream, doesn't damage your gut bacteria, and there's no, that it won't quit working, basically. All right? This goes into Paulina's question. Can you go back to anyone? Okay. Paulina Graziskak. Sorry about that. I tried. <laughs> um, can you go back to inulin after a round of 28 days of rifaximin? My daughter's nearly five. The inulin worked okay, but we decided to switch due to some other worrying lab results. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you may, when you're starting this, um, let me go back one. When you're starting this and you don't think there's gains and you move on to rifaximin, okay, and you're doing that, you might realize in retrospect, hey, she was actually having gains, but the problem was uh, she had some dental problems and it seemed like nothing was getting better. You know, maybe the inulin still worked because in the, for the younger kids, the inulin works great. And for a long time, this is the, of the young kids, this is the minority that need to go on to rifaximin. So yeah, if there's any question about maybe we should have stayed on inulin a little longer, if there's something like that, yeah, you just stop uh, the rifaximin, you go back and you just see, you know, you aren't gonna cause any great catastrophe. Say you're wrong and you go back and in a week or two, you could tell your child's like, you know, not doing well or, uh, you know, having some symptoms come back, then you would just go back to rifaximin. It'll still work fine and it won't cause any problems. All right. Oh, and also in this, there's a, from uh, Jamie Philly, a question, since we're talking about bacteria and all of this, I think everybody knows I'm like no probiotics, absolutely no probiotics for a couple of reasons. One, well, I'll admit in the future, we will probably have these genetically modified high quality probiotics that can do something in particular, like maybe help depression, okay? We are nowhere near that at this point. The supplement manufacturers, there's huge fraud problems in the vitamin supplement industry. I mean, some estimates are that about 80% of all the supplements are fraud. I mean, 80% of like vitamin C, which is dirt cheap, you know, when you have the bottle, there's no vitamin C in it. Now, when you take something as expensive as making probiotics, I guarantee you they aren't really matching up what's on the label. Okay, so from one aspect, they can harm you. And here's a simple example of, of harming you. 
many doctors now are like, if you get a sinus infection, they'll say, here, take this antibiotic and then take this probiotic with it. You know, it'll protect your gut bacteria. We know the combination will damage your intestinal bacteria more than just taking the antibiotic alone. And people say, what? That doesn't make sense. Oh, yes, it does. It's just that doctors just made up this idea. That's what the science tells us. So there's there's really a lot to be learned here, okay, with probiotics. Now, but what about fermented foods? Now, I can't even exactly remember what I put in that first book, but my concern was there are certain in America, uh, and I'm sure elsewhere, these health food stores, chains where they're putting probiotics in everything and in large, large amounts. So let's take yogurt as an example. I think yogurt's super healthy. I think your traditional yogurt from your local grocery store that's got a name brand, super healthy and perfectly safe for your child uh, to consume. It's only when the products are now, you can look, they're being marketed as boosting immune system support. They use all these kind of buzz, you know, buzzwords and when you look, instead of having three or four species on there, they'll have, they'll be bragging about like 15 species and how many billions of bacteria and things like that. I think potentially those food products could bother your child um, in a way like a, a probiotic in a capsule or something. So um, that's where that comes in. All right. Now, do we use Rifaximin forever? You know? What do we do now? Well, let's let's say about how long. Say your child's on inulin. You're cooking along. Everything's going really good. Year two, three, you're pretty much got a normal kid. What do we do now? Well, the fish oil and olive oil, as we were talking about, is really a reflection of the food supply. And that problem isn't going to go away. They've known about this for 20, 30 years. I don't, I anticipate my remaining years on earth, I'm going to have fish oil and olive oil every day because I just don't have any faith that they're going to fix the food supply. So that's kind of a long-term thing. The other thing is the inulin. So you're controlling the bacteria. And if you say your kid's now normal-ish, whatever you term you want to use for that, and you stop, there's always a chance it could come back. Okay? So I would suggest you just continue the inulin indefinitely. It's safe. I mean, it's in onions and garlic. You know, the versions I recommend are in agave, but there's good versions in Jerusalem artichokes and chicory and things like that. It's, it's a very, very safe product to use in a nonstop way. So that would remain indefinitely. What if you're using rifaximin? Okay. So... If your kid, if you had to go all the way up to nonstop Rifaximin, okay, what we have found is you need to go about 12 months. And then after that, um, you can try to back off to the once a month, the 10 days a month cycle. And that works in most of the kids. We tried using continuous for six months and then backing up and almost everybody was still relapsing too quickly. So continuous for 12 months, cyclic for 12 months, and then, especially if you're, there are some kids where when they relapse, they get diarrhea or a bad rash or something that's quite obvious. Then maybe you can just use it intermittently when those symptoms appear. Um, and, and then likewise, if you only needed monthly or cyclic rifaximin, you could maybe after 12 months try to back off to every now and then. That's kind of an idealistic view of things. I think the reality is, and what the parents are doing, and I wholeheartedly agree, is when we get this 10 days a month and the kids are doing great, the parents just ain't stopping. I've got some kids now, they've been on it for a couple of years, and it's just better, 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 better. You know why? This really, we've got a drug that's super safe, okay, doesn't get in the bloodstream, doesn't damage your gut bacteria, there's no resistance, it won't quit working. Why the heck stop? Okay, let's get a normal kid. That's really the goal here. If this was a neurological condition in adults, they would use much more, much more toxic, risky things than this. I guarantee you they would. And now what happens 
when you reach neurotypical and you're on monthly rifaximin. Right now, you know, if it was my child or my grandchild, I'm just going to keep them on it. I don't want them to relapse. I want them to feel good. I want them to be normal. I want the family to have a normal family. And instead of the constant worrying about this, just help everybody heal out of this process. And, you know, quite honestly, I don't have the technical ability to figure out what to do next. We don't know how to prevent these relapses. You know, we don't know how to rebuild your gut bacteria correctly. Because just doing a fecal transplant isn't going to solve this. So, you know, there's lots and lots of work being done on this. But... You know, that answer may be five or 10 years away, how we're going to be able to stabilize the gut bacteria and prevent this in people. So until then, my advice would be generally it's long-term maintenance to help maintain uh, a normal neurological status for your kids. Speaking of that, here's just a question from the stream. Oh, does COVID cause a relapse in SIBO? Okay, that's a good question. What? What causes SIBO first? Okay, so bacterial overgrowth. So SIBO again is you've got the normal fish bacteria in the colon living up with the birds. Now there'll probably be more to this answer as we learn more scientifically, but it's quite clear you gotta have kind of two things for SIBO to occur. One is there has to be some damage to the gut bacteria. We know in some cases in adults, and we, know from since around 1900 we're losing species with each maternal generation so for instance our collective great-grandmothers might have lost in 1900 two percent of bacteria in their childhood from say arsenic or mercury they go up they grow up they give birth to grandma grandma starts at 98 percent grandma's exposed to pesticides and chemicals she loses another three she grows up, gives birth to our mom. Now our moms are at 95%. Our moms get the old antibiotics. They lose another five. We grow up and and now we're at 90%. You know, young women get a Cipro or a Z pack. They might lose another five or 10. You grow up and your kids like 80, 85%. So there's something like that happening, we know worldwide, where the species counts are dropping. Whether it's the total species count that drop or there's some unique bacteria that help, because the birds and the fish bacteria wanna stay apart. So it's either the total number drops or some unique species that are responsible for that are missing. And so you have now this instability when you've lost these bacteria and the bacteria just wanna do that. The primary thing that's gonna drive that is slow intestinal tract motility. If you think of your intestinal tract like a conveyor belt, okay it'll slow down now sometimes other things like antibiotics or an illness can do it but really the primary thing probably the most common thing is anything that slows your intestinal tract down to trigger SIBO now we know when people get a simple concussion you get hit in the head in the first week 30 to or 50 to 70 percent of adults are constipated after a head injury and that sounds kind of strange to people, but constipation primarily is coming out of a brain injury, all right? And that's a condition of slow motility. Now, your immune system can give you a concussion, all right? And that's what COVID does. COVID will, will drive up your immune response so much, you get a concussion-like blast to the head, and your intestinal tract will slow down. And when that happens, boom, SIBO. And I think it's going to be a fairly common cause. Now, there's going to be multiple common cause of long hauler symptoms in SIBO. There's going to be other things, certainly, but this is going to be a, a, a common cause because a lot of these people have um, uh, intestinal symptoms. A third of them really weren't, didn't have their long haul symptoms until a couple weeks after they were sick. And what that tells me is the bacteria are slowly growing up there and starting to cause their problems. So I think it's uh it's a very common cause of uh, COVID. It's a very common cause of SIBO. And I think a round of rifaximin would fix most of those people up rather quickly. All right. You have any, any, another one? Mm -hmm. This one came in a little bit ago. Okay. Olive oil. 
the phenol counts in olive oil, the phenol, the phenol wars, I call it. Okay, there's two important aspects to olive oil. One and the most important is an omega-9 called oleic acid. This is the primary molecule that blocks vegetable oils. All right. And in speaking of that, when in, in trying to, you know, limit the, uh, these omega-6s in the household, just get rid of the main stuff. If you're getting olive oil every day and your kids still say you're traveling and there's some potato chips and they might have safflower oil in them or something, the olive oil you give them every day will protect you from those potato chips. Okay. So don't, don't, spend a huge amount of time trying to get rid of every little tiny fraction of omega-6s out of the food. Now, so the oleic acid is the main component that will do that. Uh, I should add also olive oil has vitamin E, uh, which is a very good and potent antioxidant. That's good stuff for you. And then there are the phenols. And phenols are plant chemicals that create a, a health effect in the body. Now, Many phenols do this because they're slightly toxic to the body. And that doesn't really make sense to people. Like coffee or green tea have phenols in them and they cause a negative stress at the cellular level. But what that stress does is it makes your cells, your cells will respond in what we call a hormesis. And this is where the cells, in terms of this negative effect, the cells fight back and become stronger. Old cells that are weak are quickly replaced. I mean, it's a very dynamic strength inducing effect at a, when you have a low level of these phenols and like coffee. But if you were to take phenol capsules of coffee and get a huge amount of them, it would probably make you sick. Okay, because that toxicity just grows. And now instead of it making you stronger, it just starts overwhelming the system and makes you sick. The phenol counts traditionally in the Mediterranean diet can range, you know, so you're talking about people who get like four tablespoons of olive oil a day. So if you're getting two tablespoons of olive oil a day, you're probably talking about to, to get that full health benefit, uh, you know, phenols in the range of three to 600. Okay, uh, which if you're getting, and that has to do by volume for two tablespoons a day. There are more and more products I'm seeing, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 phenol counts. And I don't think this is good, actually. It's, we're certainly in uncharted waters. There's human tissue culture data showing like phenols at around the eight, seven, eight hundred level concentration will damage tissue uh, in a culture, human cells. And we've had some experience uh, with, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but where kids seem to have gotten worse when they shifted over to one of these, I, the term I use is ultra high phenols. So you got low phenol, phenol rich is kind of that mid range, you know, three to 600. Ultra highs like you know nine hundred, a thousand or more. I, my personal uh, feeling about that is I think those ought to be avoided because there's potential risk here. Okay, and especially when you have a fragile nervous system, we don't know what too much of that might actually do. Okay, let's go on. Okay, we got the we got fish oil in, olive oil in. We got the gut balance, either inulin or monthly or continuous refaxment. What do we think of after that? Well, we got a question about, do we use vagus nerve stimulation? Are we gonna have a plateau? What if your kid suddenly the behavior just goes and you're doing a lot worse? And then what about diet restrictions? Well, the good thing about diet restrictions is you don't need to do them anymore, all right? So these things that, you know, gluten-free, casein-free, or fine gold or gaps, all those kind of things that you saw at the beginning benefit your kid. Uh, what we're learning is it's primarily due to the fact that there's a carbohydrate restriction. And when you starve off the bacteria, so you have overgrowth, you starve off the bacteria, it won't fix this, but it'll make it less. And you'll make less of that propionic acid. So it's basically by getting rid of carbohydrates, 
you know, there's that propionic acid remembers it's like Valium or LSD, that level lowers and you see a very real thing in the kid, in your child. And then like everybody, you're exhausted. So you uh, have your child stay with your sister, or your mom, and they don't quite understand. And they feed your child whatever carbs they want, some good old healthy food. And you pick them up and your kid's not doing too well. And you bring them home, you put them back on the diet, they do better again. So you see a very real thing. But once you balance the gut bacteria and you hardly have any bacteria up there anymore, it just doesn't matter anymore. And so you can get rid of that. And part of our goal for all of the kids is we want to get rid of these diet restrictions. We want to eventually get rid of all the therapists. We want your kid to be less special. We want him to go to, you know, you're having dinner. And if his sibling wants a piece of pizza, he can have a piece of pizza, you know, that kind of a thing. And so you can get rid of that. Then we're going to touch on these other three things here. All right, and so this is one of the charts from the book. So here you get things are good. We got significant improvement. That means you with your you got your fish oil, olive oil, and whatever you're using for the gut is working. Here you have continuous broad neurological improvement. So we don't need to do anymore. If everything's getting better, that's all you got to do. Over here is plateau. That's where we're going to talk about this. That's where things get better, and then everything stops. And then here is continuous but incomplete, meaning all sorts of things are getting better, but often there might be one thing that's stuck, all right? That's when we add the biggest stimulator. And I've got this little chart here. So this is kind of a scenario. If you were plotting things, so here, this little chart. So this is improvement, you know, as things go up to getting better. This is time over here. So. Here is recovery on the protocol. So you got your kid, fish oil, olive oil, and the gut's balanced. And you've got awareness, socialization, sleep, focus, hyperactivity, emotions, a whole bunch of things are better. But over time, you're looking, and speech just really isn't coming along. All right? Remember the very beginning, I said this is all about lowering inflammation. Right? So if something is, is not recovering like everything else, and this takes... You know, from the time you start, you know, that might be four to six months to really be able to see this. Uh, when something's really lagging behind, that's when you start the vagus nerve stimulator. All right. Five minutes a day, lowers inflammation, 24 to 36 hours in the kids. And then usually within four to six weeks, whatever it is, in this example, we're talking about speech, speech will start recovering. Now, it's not always speech is late. Speech can be doing better, and you're stuck with hyperactivity, and that'll get better. Or you're stuck with socialization no better, and that'll start to improve, okay? And so, but that's when you use the Vegas stimulator. So you've got something that's lagging, that's not getting better like all these other areas, all righty? And the Vegas stimulators, if for if those of you who haven't seen them, so we have a device here that uh, we're using and here, and basically we have designed a device that um, uh, can be powered by either an Android or an iPhone. Now the vagus nerve, when it comes down, it shoots a little branch out to the ear and in the bowl of the ear. And you can put this clip on there. You have to wipe it with alcohol and you hit a button on your phone and the software through these computer chips, where am I here? Right in there, through these computer chips is regulating the electricity. Now the electricity, you don't feel anything. The child won't feel a thing. And uh, you just do that five minutes a day. And that is very, very powerful tool at lowering inflammation in your child. So that's what a bagel stimulator looks like. At least a transcutaneous one. Most of the ones you read about, they're actually surgically implanted in the chest for epilepsy. But for our purposes, this works just as well uh, for controlling inflammation. All right, the plateau, the dreaded plateau. Again, you use a vagal stimulator when everything's getting better, except for one thing. These things keep getting better. You just got one thing that's kind of stuck. The plateau is you had improvement and everything kind of comes to a stop. And it's not a horrible thing. It's not like all heck breaks loose or something. It's really 
I, I call it a very, the most obvious vague thing you'll ever see. And the parents and then the teachers or the therapists are like, is this something going on at home? Because we ain't getting anything done lately. And you'll see that. Now, now this happens either when you have inulin uh, failing, inulin failure, meaning you put them on inulin, it works, so it separates the fish from the birds. And then maybe after six months or two years, it quits working. Okay. And you get that, you get bacteria back up there, you get that inflammation, it goes to the brain and it stops the recovery process. So we got to fix that again. So that the older the child, the more likely you're going to get inulin failure. Um, or you're having, because that intestinal motility is really slow, you give them a round of rifaximin and boom, they're relapsing uh, now fast. Now, if you have a child on monthly rifaximin, okay, they're getting better, getting better, getting better. What can happen is if they get a concussion, say uh, just whatever injury, they slip in the bathroom and hit their head, that can slow the intestinal tract down that now the monthly cycles don't work and you've got to go to continuous rifaximin because they're, they, the intestinal motility slowed down too much and you've got to do that. Now, as we discussed, you put them on continuous for about a year and then back off from that. Supplements can do cause a plateau. We've seen that several times. We've seen the addition of probiotics can do it. Lord knows mixing protocols can do this because there's all sorts of stuff being thrown at these kids. And who knows if it's the gut bacteria from some of these compounds or the effects they have on their brain and things like that, um, they can do it. So this is kind of your, your little trouble list, like either inulin failure or you got to be a little bit more aggressive with the rifaximin because, you know, they had an injury, supplements, probiotics, and, and avoiding the other protocols. And when you do this, um, when you go through this and fix either of these things very quickly, you'll be progressing again. Answer Kylie's question. Okay. Well, we'll, okay. Well, we'll we're going to talk about this okay. later. We're going to talk about this a little later. But how about, how about another one since we're here? All right. Oh, here's one. Here's a common one. Uh, Cami Gallagher. And there's many of you had questions along this line about, and it's basically, can we be providing care in other parts of the world? Can't we do these pres provide prescriptions online and uh, for the rifaximin and obviously the pandemic and just the distance of money and time and trouble to come and see me in Arizona if your local doctors aren't going to help you out is we're just handcuffed by the licensing laws. And, and it's not, I mean, I, my medical license is dictated by the state of Arizona, but this is very common uh, around the country. I have to see people in the office first, okay? And it's also my malpractice carrier dictates me to do that. Now, if you're overseas and we send you prescriptions, those countries will give me a hard time. And we had from one uh, friendly country actually sending us letters thinking I was a psychiatrist or something and giving us a hard time. So I, I've i got to obviously maintain my medical license and to do so, I mean, I can't put that at risk. And so it's, it's completely out of our hands. And some people will say, well, I know other doctors and they do this or that. Well, that's their risk. I'm not going to do that. We... My wife, Jean, is an attorney. We look at this very carefully. We're very uh, cautious about this. I just can't, and I'm sorry. And so, and our goals are trying to, you know, that's right. If you get the book to the doctor, we've got a journal article about the protocol. Sometimes you show that to them, that can kind of kind of shake them loose. This is a problem. It's a definite problem. And... Uh, until the universities are more involved and are publishing more uh, university sponsored kind of work, it's going to be hard to get uh, a lot of doctors on board with this. And it's just going to be chip away one at a time. So for a whole bunch of questions around that, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, quick question about sleep uh, from Ella Etrema. Melatonin. Um, I think it's fine. I have so little worries about it, but they haven't proven to be anything and there's no recovery. 
And so a little melatonin, if that helps your kids sleep, I think that's good. Once they're sleeping really well and everything's going good, you try to get off of it. And that goes for also if you're treating anything like constipation with magnesium and they're, they're pooping a little bit more and everything seems to be fine, try to get them off of it. You know, you can always back your way out of that. I generally talk about, I don't want supplements. I don't want vitamins. I don't want all that kind of stuff. The exceptions, this is another question uh, that came up is, you know, if your pediatrician says uh, your child needs iron, you give them iron. Or if they say your vitamin D is low, you give them vitamin D. But do not get these panels of everything and give them a whole bunch of supplements out of these, like the oats panel or something like that, that does not represent I think appropriate medicine in any way, shape, or form. Which ties into that question. Which ties into <laughs> now I, I apologize. I can't read no. Russian script. So I don't know your name. But it might be Arena? Arena, maybe? maybe. Um is it necessary to test for heavy metals while on the protocol? Uh and, and can treatments be combined with the protocol? One. You do not combine any protocol with any protocol, okay? I mean, this applies to just adult medicine. If you have diabetes and you got two different doctors, you don't mix these things that they're doing. You follow one strategy over the other, okay? Otherwise, you can get in trouble with that. And uh, the heavy metal issue, <clears throat> now, there are places and problems with children getting heavy metal, like old buildings, old plumbing, you know, lead poisoning is probably the classic example. Uh, and so that's a well-found thing. There's a way to deal with that. But that's not what people are talking about here. They're talking about the vaccines and things as a source of heavy metal and all of that. Quite frankly, I totally disagree with that. Okay. Um, there is a outstanding and a continual reinforcement of data that this whole problem is about inflammation. All right. Now, one of the bonuses of having healthy gut bacteria is there are papers that show that those gut bacteria will consume heavy metals. They'll actually bind them up inside of them and take them out with a stool. And that this is a natural mechanism, we think, for you know, where we live in Arizona, there's arsenic in the local water because there's silver mines up in the mountains. All right. Now the city does something to get the arsenic out. But when you were an Indian here, if you had healthy gut bacteria, it's more likely your gut bacteria would just protect you from that stuff. So your, your microbiome is capable of protecting you, but as a true driving source of autism, I, I don't believe it. Um, a, a real confusing thing for people on different protocols is, so we have ba gut bacteria. That's your primary problem. Rifaximin is very effective at fixing that, probably up in the 90% range. But if you give a child just one 10-day course of amoxicillin, okay, so for an earache, ear infection, you have about a 20% chance you're going to fix that, at least for a while. Now, so like a child's on a protocol ABC, whatever it is, and over here, he gets an ear infection, that child, and this doctor gives him amoxicillin. If it fixes the gut bacteria, they suddenly think this protocol made them do better. Okay. It's a real confounding thing. These kids are getting a lot of antibiotics that are going to temporarily fix their gut bacteria, get rid of that propionic acid, at least for a while. And you see these spikes in behavior that they're doing better. So it, it easily can be explaining a lot of the occasional uh, improvements parents are seeing with this wide, wide variety of these different therapies. All right. So, remember, it's all about inflammation. It's all about gut bacteria. Okay. Then we have these episodes where everything's going good. You know, we got the vagal stimulator, say, so everything's kind of improving. And we get in this period of time where suddenly, and this is a, you know, it's like a, people say relapse or regression. But really what's happening is, when you look at the child, it's intense aggression or anxiety, okay? That this just starts rising and rising and rising and rising. And it'll look like they regress, 
you know, like their speech, they can't speak as well, some old behaviors kind of come back. But over through this is a lot of anxiety and aggression. And it's really pain or a drop in blood pressure in their head from some other source. And it's just that, you know, a lot of the kids will experience, you know, if your kid learns is learning to speak, think of that skill like a musician playing an instrument. And it when they when the child's experiencing this uh, anger and anxiety kind of response, they basically experience what's like stage fright for a musician. So a musician in the studio can play really well that day, that very same day uh, in the evening, he's playing in front of a couple thousand people and he can't play very well because he's so nervous. It looks like he regressed to use a phrase. Okay. He didn't, he still has the skills he had that morning. It's just the anxiety and the aggression gets in the way of him focusing and being able to do that well enough. So you'll have this like, they're anxious, they're aggressive, they're more hyperactive, maybe hungry, the focus is down, they can't communicate too well. And uh, that's what you'll see kind of typically over a week or a couple weeks come, comes on pretty strong, which they need an examination. There's something wrong with the kid, okay? Or, well, one, if there's something completely obvious in the house, like I've seen this happen when their house burned down and they suddenly had to move and it's just a family. So some major, you would figure that out. But for the most part, you can have ear infections can do this. Sinus infections can do this. You can have bladder infections do this. If kids peeing, peeing, peeing. You know, you can think about a bladder infection. What's really common and hidden are dental infections. So if there's no obvious ear, nose, throat kind of infection things, I, I encourage the families, take them to the dentist, let's get some x-rays. It's almost weekly now we're getting feedback from families like, yep, you had a big impacted molar and an abscess and three root canals. You're, and bacterial, oh, and then severe allergies, not just mild seasonal stuff, but pretty, pretty significant stuff. Those can trigger all this too. You know, in terms of the teeth, a um, couple things. One, when you have bacterial overgrowth, okay, the fish with the birds, that causes advanced or accelerated gum disease and tooth decay. So they're a setup for dental problems. And then you might have some behavioral just issues where it's just impossible to get a dentist to look at it without giving them general anesthesia. You got that issue. And then what happens is, and we see this in adults, when you have bacterial overgrowth, your immune system doesn't work very well. You can easily have a little bit of bacteria in there and you don't even know until we balance your gut bacteria and you get this healthy immune response and now your immune system finally finds those, that infection and will flare up and cause something. So sometimes you'll see this a couple weeks after uh, or a month or two after a shift in balancing the gut bacteria, like going from amulin to rifaximin and this will happen. You got to look at the teeth. It's a very, very common, common thing. All right. Any more questions? Um, rate of recovery. That's a good one. Um, oh, from Fiona. Yeah. Fiona Tafano. So basically, she's asking, what's the rate of recovery? Okay, I put in the original book, there was a paper that talked about two to three months of recovery for every month on fish oil. Those were six-year-olds, and they were just looking at de developmental issues over, I think it was a year. Um, it varies widely, widely. You can have two kids that are the same age, say they're both six and you're going to start the protocol. One of them, and they, if they both have propionic acid, they're both behaving kind of a little, you know, funny, autistic kind of typical features from propionic acid. But underneath that, one can have profound developmental delay and in injuries, even developmental arrest. And the other one, just a little bit. But they kind of look the same because the drug effect of propionic acid is so great. Now you fix the gut bacteria, the propionic acid goes away. The one with very little developmental delay and so forth really seems to recover fast. The other one just takes so much longer. Okay. So at the same age, you can have a lot of variability. Over time, though, 
you know, one of the issues that's happening, not only do you have developmental delay, you have injuries building. All these simple little injuries don't get repaired. And you have cumulative brain injury as the injuries start building up in the brain. So obviously, if you're 16 versus six, that 16-year-old has 10 more years of cumulative brain injury to build up that has to get fixed. So that's going to definitely take longer. And, uh, and so the key is, and I have total respect. I mean, I, I've never been in your shoes, all right? I don't know the emotional impact of this, but my advice is you can't look at the finish line, like get to normal. You have to look at kind of where you've come from and stay focused on how things are moving forward from where you were. And I advise people in the office when they see me do a little diary entry just once a month, not a whole bunch of notes, just like once a month. So you get this little point. So when you're stressing out about the rate of recovery, you can very quickly look back over several months of the last year. And many parents will completely forget about how bad things were, you know? And so that's, that's really what you got to do is you look at that and one, you look and make sure everything's going forward. And if it's not right, you have the vagal stimulator. And then you just keep track that everything continues to go forward. I don't see any barriers to recovery yet. Okay. I say yet because, you know, we've got 16 year olds who are several years in the protocol, huge improvements, but they still got a ways to go, but they aren't stopping. You know, we've got 30 year olds, same thing, improving. Seems really slow. But when you compare it to six months before, it's a lot that there is happening with them. So, I just don't have this, like there's some magical thing that we can't get through. I just don't see that yet. And uh, I know there have been experts in the past who said, oh, at five or at 10, if this doesn't happen, these things won't happen. You know, I just respectfully say those are really more academic guesses at reality than what reality might be. And we're probably the most experienced at seeing what reality is. So don't ever give up hope. You just got to be patient, okay? And um, uh, in, in terms of recovery, so look and just focus on the gains you've made and don't try to put a timeline in front of you because that's going to create this artificial kind of problem. Which takes us right into, <laughs> I forgot I had this slide. No substitute for patience, sorry. Does that sound like... <laughs> An important thing is you can't, once you see everything kind of going better, getting better, um, you can't speed it up. The body, the, all the different tissue in the body, you know, my snarky way of saying this is there's only two speeds for recovery. You do and you don't. All right. And so like if you have a broken arm, pretty much everybody needs a cast for like four or five weeks because nobody can get the bone to heal in two, period. You get a, a cut in your hand, seven to 10 days. Nobody can get it to heal faster. Same thing goes for the nervous system. Okay, so there's only one speed. Getting this thing, trying to get it better, faster. Okay, there's an old say saying in all sorts of industries, better is the enemy of good enough. I've seen so many cases get screwed up where the kid was chugging along, doing well, and then they go off and do X, Y, Z, and we got just nothing but problems, okay? So you, you just can't speed up recovery. And if you do, you may uh, cause trouble. And then as I was just commenting about uh, the great differences in the rate of recovery, because the kids are starting at a different place from a neurological standpoint. If you do, or in this place where you're like, you know, you know, the kids have always kind of been recovering Even before the protocol. We just aren't seeing much. There's kind of a little checklist I've uh, put up with. Uh, a very important one is non-approved products, meaning like, and especially inulin. The now food inulin, and we're going to be coming out here next month with what's called Nimichek Blue. We're going to have a blue agave inulin. I'll talk about that a little bit later. If you're it's a very common thing that people are using other inulins and the kid's really not gaining. 
much. And then I'll force them to go back to now and boom, they, they start doing well. The problem now right now is there's a huge international shortage of inulin and it has to do with the pandemic. And so uh, that's where we've been are, are trying to help supply some more inulin for everybody. So non-approved products are a big one. Missing doses. Life can be hard. You got several kids, you got jobs, you got blah, blah, all that. That's a biggie, okay? And now if you miss your fish oil or olive oil dose, generally I tell people try to make it up, you know? And, uh, but for and inulin, you really can't. And if you're missing too many of those doses, the bacteria will come up there and it doesn't take much to get a lot of inflammation and then things are going to slow down. Um, and that's where, you know, loss of intestinal balance, uh, if your vagus stimulator is not working, okay, uh, and you're using it, or a very common mistake people make is you've got to, when you put your vagus stimulator on, you've got to wipe it with alcohol, you know, rubbing alcohol, like from doctor's office, and you got to wipe that. The oil on your skin will block that, all right? Again, slow recovery, looking for more inflammation. Remember, this is all about inflammation. Dental sinus infections, like we talked about. If your child has uh, autoimmune disorder like Crohn's, that could slow things down because that's producing its own. Now, here's one that uh, could be very well an issue. And we had an a issue with a child moving back to London, believe it or not. Um, diesel exhaust is highly, highly toxic. I mean, not that uh, gasoline exhaust is any great thing, but in terms of brain inflammation, diesel exhaust and these things called microparticles are a big factor. So that could, in certain cases, uh, be important. And then frequent seizures. I don't have scientific data on exactly why this would be, but there's just a, a general trend that those kids just seem to uh, recover more slowly. Now, if you have frequent seizures and you're recovering fast, great. And it just may be I'm missing something in these cases, but um, each seizure is almost like a concussion for the child. And so that's, we've seen. So what do you do? One, get perspective. What do I mean by that? I mean, ask somebody else because you're, you're in the fire. You're with the kids all the time. You're stressed out. They've got pandemic stress, all this kind of stuff. And you feel like this is never going to end. And you're starting to kind of ask the teachers. You know, you'll have a relative come over that hasn't been there in like two months and you're thinking nothing's getting better and they show up and they're like, wow, he's so much different. And you're like, really? So these people can help you kind of look at your journal, your once a month journal. That'll help you get a, a perspective on like, well, maybe it isn't so slow after all, okay? Um, find or solve any of these other problems I'm talking about. And in some more rare cases, and this is older kids, you know, teens, 20s, where I had, you know, one kid where Rifaximum, we added inulin to it, and it seemed to help. I have one kid, we, instead of twice a day Rifaximum, we did three times a day, that helped. Uh, we've had just a couple with a VNS, where instead of just once a day, we did two or three times a day, and that seemed to help. So here's some other little things I'll do. But for the most part, it's dealing with these, this list here and going back and then also making sure it really is just slow versus not as fast as you hoped it would be. Those are two different things, okay? So vaccinations, I'm going to tread lightly here. <laughs> you don't have to write me and give me hell about this, but people want to know about like COVID vaccine and everything. So I'm going to talk about vaccines in general. Okay, common side effects. One, lightheaded, dizzy, clammy, racing heart. That can happen in any person when you puncture their skin with anything. So if you get your blood drawn or you just get a needle in you without a vaccine in it, it could trigger that, okay? Fever or rash. Vaccines are designed to stimulate an immune response. And those are just a manifestation of that in I'm an ex-HIV doctor and the fever and rash, I'm just kind of like, wow, oh, good, it worked, you know? And 
and those can go away in a couple of days. Now, you can also get a little fever in the arm. You got to worry about that. And, and then the immune system can actually give you a little concussion. Okay, this is well known. Um, it can happen from vaccines or surgeries or fractures. Just the immune system stress can give you this concussion-like effect. And, uh, but if your gut's balanced, you got fish oil and olive oil, you can recover from that. Because of that concussion, remember I talked about the intestinal slowing after a head injury? Sometimes it can trigger bacterial overgrowth. And I think this is the linkage that people see for why did vaccines trigger in some kids autism, okay? It slows down the gut, you get overgrowth, you make some propionic acid, you get these autistic features. Um, but now we certainly know not all autism is from vaccines. We have many cases, the kids never even got a vaccine and they get autism. Why? Something else caused that, antibiotics or an illness or a surgery or something. And but if you're in the protocol and you're wondering, should I go back and give my kid vaccines? Because I got to stay in school, like in New York, it's really bad, right? You got to get your vaccines uh, because the rules are so strict. You got fish oil and olive oil, and they're helping with the repair process. And if you're using inulin or rifaximin to prevent SIBO, to control that, you shouldn't really have any problem with that. Okay? And so... In, in these kind of short-term, just kind of problems that people see, we've had many, many kids go back where vaccines might have been part of the mix, and they do just fine. They're doing just fine uh, getting vaccines. Uh, these these concerns would apply to some degree to uh, COVID vaccines in adults. You know, I just don't make comments about kids because we don't have data on them, but I guess it would probably be the same there, but we have to wait for the data on that. And then long-term side effects. Of vaccines. Now, I get it. If if a vaccine has triggered autism, that's a long-term ongoing side effect, but it was really from triggering SIBO, in my opinion, all right? And there's a lot of data that is suggesting that that's correct. And But all vaccines have different risks, okay? It depends your risk of getting the condition versus if it's worth to have the vaccine. And so, you know, and these things really, this is a longer, more complicated conversation that everybody just, if you're concerned, you got to talk to your doctor. You got to read up what the CDC says and things like that. So, um, so that's, that's kind of my, my issue. Generally the kids, you, if you're on the protocol, you got your gut balance, they're going to tolerate your traditional vaccines and not have uh, any, any major problem with them. Any other questions here? How about this one from Mike and Rosanna. Mike and Rosanna. Does everyone see an awakening? No. Okay. So what? Let me explain. The kids have basically three problems when you have autism. And you get bacterial overgrowth and inflammation. It causes three problems. You can't prune your brain. So kids go from 100 billion down to 50 billion neurons. If you don't prune right, that's developmental delay. You get these little injuries you can't repair, and that's cumulative brain injury. It starts stacking up, okay? And the third thing is the bacteria is making propionic acid, which has a sedating effect on your child. Not all bacteria make propionic acid, but all bacteria will cause developmental delay, if you're young enough, and cumulative brain injury. It just depends if the bacteria is making propionic acid or not. So, in the, you know, I've seen some kids that were diagnosed with autism, and I'm like, they don't really have autism. They got developmental delay, but then they do not have autism. And some providers, I think, well, if they're like, eh, maybe let's give a let's give them a diagnosis because then you'll get some resources, right? And it opens up some community resources for your child. So, so they may even make the diagnosis and not being, they know they aren't quite right just to kind of help the family. And so if you have bacterial overgrowth without propionic acid and you use inulin or rifaximin, no awakening. There's no, this Valium stuff isn't in the bloodstream. You aren't going to see a change there. It's only if you're making the propionic acid. Now that propionic acid will dissipate and it's like you took your kid off a medicine. 
okay, within a few days or a week or so, you're like, wow, look, he's more alert, he's more aware, because he's not sedated. Now, also, when you start the protocol, the older the child, so I'll say eight, 10, eight years old or above, I'm not surprised at all if they don't have, even if they had classic autism features early on in life, I'm not surprised if they don't have an awakening at that point. And I just think over time, they now have a different bacteria up there that's not making propionic acid or something like that. So, um, uh, and then also when you have inulin, so you have a little kid, clearly autistic, put him on inulin, you get an awakening, say you go a year or two, inulin failure, you put him on rifaximin, no awakening. That happens a lot. Why is that? Well, I think the bacteria that started growing up there after inulin just doesn't make propionic acid. So the, the, the awakening part is just revolves around whether the bacteria can make propionic acid or not. And I also want to say, I, I won't be surprised if in 10 years, it's not just propionic acid, they find two, three or four different chemicals that are being made, all kind of having different or similar neurological effects. So just that kind of model in particular, I think is, um, uh, how well does this work? Um, pretty good, actually. <laughs> So we've got, uh, we're approaching about 700 kids uh, under our care. This was, I did this a little while back. Um, so you can see here, I went through the chart. I have these huge tables, spreadsheets and everything of everybody, like how old they are, when they start, when do you get this, when do they get vagal stimulation, all of that. And so we looked, we have a little over 400. They're mostly around eight, uh, you know, three quarters are men or males. Uh, they've been on the protocol getting close to two years and 80% of them were in this just continual mode of in, uh, increased recovery where parents, teachers, therapists, you know, the parents are like, oh yeah. I mean, the parents are just really happy that they, we were at this pace where we feel we're catching up. Okay. And beyond way beyond what they were prior to the protocol. So it's a very high level. I think, more recently, it's even higher if I had done, you know, I had the time to do this here recently. Um, in all of that, uh, and there's a whole mixture there of inulin and rifaximin and so forth. Now, the people I see tend to need rifaximin more because they had inulin failure. You know, they'll drive all the way from Philadelphia because they need rifaximin. If you're in Philadelphia and the inulin works and doesn't quit, fail, it doesn't fail, I don't see those kids so much anymore. So I'm a little, these are even some of the more difficult kids that we have a really good response rate here. And uh, when we're using the Vegas nerve stimulator, uh, you know, in the kids we use it, it works in about 80% of the kids, 81%. You can, for speech, focus, and behavior in particular, those are the biggies where we see. It, it has a significant impact within typically about two months uh, out of that. So this is, uh, we're, we're very happy with the success here, especially with the safety margins we have when we're treating these kids. So the new book, okay. Right now you get it at nimichekprotocol.com. I hope that's simple enough. Nimichekprotocol.com. It's a pre-order and uh, there's, problems with this slide. Anyhow, uh, it's a pre-order and it'll be out mid late May. Okay. If you can get a copy for your doctor, if, if the doctor's like, that's kind of interesting, get a copy for the doctor and get a copy, maybe even better. You give it to the nurse and they'll read it and be, wow, Dr. Jones, you really need to look at this. Okay. That might be even the better way to do it. Uh, we hope to have the Spanish print version soon. Soon meaning two months, you know, might be a reasonable time frame. Ebooks are coming out soon. We're working and analyzing for multiple languages. There are now ebook translating apps where we could just have our English version, or maybe we modify our English version so you could have translation apps for German and Polish and Spanish or Portuguese or whatever, 
the language is. So we're trying to evaluate that. We are not going to be printing a whole bunch of different language books. I apologize. It's just really expensive and a huge amount of time uh, to do that. And we think it's much more efficient if we just work on a English version that the translating apps can modify into multiple languages. So we're working on that right now. All you got to say is, you know, you've learned a lot here. There's people talking on the internet. Don't guess. Just get the manual, basically, you know. I mean, if somebody's telling you about your car, you know, try this or that, you don't just go guess at fixing it. You get a little guide that'll help you through to fix the thing. Just do that here. I think it'll help you a lot in, in moving forward and, and kind of empower you a bit more. Our inulin, uh, Nimichek Blue. This is a spinoff of our olive oil, Nimichek Gold. Okay. And um, it's a blue agave. It's organic. It's a non-GMO. It's, you know, some of the best stuff you can get. It's the identical type of plant that is in Now Foods. And that will be available in a few weeks at NimicheckBlue.com. Uh, we will eventually also have fish oil uh, and the olive oil being purchased there. You know, Vitality, uh, SmartCable.com. You can uh, go there uh, for that. So we're trying to set up all of these pieces. You're certainly free to use different olive oil, different inulin, you know, approved brands. And we talked about the approved brands in the book. But for those who are interested, we're going to have these available for you. Any other last questions? All right. Everybody, well, this has been fun. Um, I think it went halfway decent. We're going to, this will be on YouTube and Facebook and uh, maybe LinkedIn. And uh, we'll, we'll put those up there. Uh, we're toying around with the idea of doing in a couple months one of these sessions just for adults and the protocol i apologize we've lagged on the book for adults uh but it's just the the kid issue has just been overwhelming us but we're gonna get to the adults this year i promise you so otherwise everybody have a lovely day thanks for joining us take care of your kids and uh we'll see you on the uh